Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, hopefully, I'll live up to that introduction. So we have about 45 minutes, and we're going to talk about medicines, talk about how to get the most from the medicines you take to help you live long, healthy, happy, and productive lives, and how to avoid some of the common pitfalls that can come from often taking too many medicines. What does too many mean? How could that possibly be a bad thing? Uh, we'll talk about some things to look out for. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself first, just so you know where I'm coming from. So I'm a, I'm a clinician. I'm a geriatrician. I specialize in the care of older adults. Um, I've done a, a wide variety of primary care practices in the past, including at the San Francisco VA and through the UCSF House Calls program, which is the most fun I've ever had as a doctor, I have to tell you. <laughs> right now, my clinical practice is all at the San Francisco VA, where I take care of veterans on the inpatient service um, through internal medicine service and also through our geriatrics uh, program. Um, I have a second life as a scientist, a secret life where I try to understand some of the molecular mechanisms of aging and how to apply this to improve our lives and keep us healthier longer. I won't be talking about that today, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions later if you're curious. Uh, but about medicines, too much of a good thing. So first of all, I have no financial interest to disclose. Maybe one day this will change. <laughs> but I have no profit interest in anything I'm going to tell you. So here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, first, medicines save lives. I think it'll be important to say that out loud, and we'll talk a little bit about that as just to kind of set the tone. Uh, but then, uh, how to avoid some of the pitfalls of medicines. We'll talk about polypharmacy. What is polypharmacy? Um, and how can that hurt you as a person? We'll talk about some general principles of how you should think about your medicines. Um, and then some very specific suggestions on what you can do together with your, your doctor and your healthcare team to keep yourself safe and to make sure you're getting the most from the medicines that you take. Uh, we're going to talk in, in terms of general principles. Though. I'm not going to uh, give you kind of specific medical advice on take this medicine or don't take that medicine, uh, but I want to give you tools that you can use uh, for whatever medicines you take, whatever stage you are in your life, uh, that you can use together with your doctor and your healthcare team to take the best care of yourself. Okay, medicines save lives. Since we're gonna spend most of this time talking about the downsides of medicines, I think it's important to just say out loud, medicines work. Medicines are one of the components of the modern medical miracle. I think of together with, together with vaccines and surgery and some other things that have helped so many of us live longer, healthier, um, happier lives throughout the 20th century. Medicines save lives. I'll show you a couple of specific examples of, of how some of my favorite medicines help to save lives. Um, we'll talk uh, quite a bit in the next 45 minutes about blood pressure as an example, treating blood pressure. Um, a lot of us probably are on blood pressure medicines. A lot of us are pretty familiar with what this means. I'm gonna show you some data. Um, when I show you data like this, I'll try to walk you through it. Uh, but this is some data from a large randomized trial of treating high blood pressure in older adults. Uh, this is a trial called HiVet. It was unusual in that it actually only enrolled, only included people over 85 years old. This is almost unheard of for a, random, for a large randomized clinical trial. One of the problems in modern medicine is we don't test things often enough in older adults. But this was a landmark trial that included only people over 85 um, and randomized them to either receive blood pressure medicines or not. And, and the question that they were trying to answer is, um, does treating blood pressure in, in older adults um, save lives uh, or reduce the, the incidence of serious diseases like heart attacks or strokes. And it was a pretty dramatic result. Um, treating blood pressure uh, saved lives. It reduced the, the risk of dying in the group that received the treatment by about 20% over just a few years. Um, so this is the, the number of deaths uh, uh, from people in the trial. This is the number of years they were in the trial. Um, and the placebo group, uh, the, the group that was receiving um, blood pressure medicines, the active treatment group, died about 20% less. So this is a really dramatic outcome. Simple thing of treating blood pressure with just one or two medicines uh, reduced these people's risk of dying by 20%. So medicines save lives. Uh, this is not the only trial of blood pressure in older adults. You guys may have heard of the SPRINT trial, which uh, got some press just last fall when it was stopped early because it was working so well. So this was the next question. So treating blood pressure at all save lives. Uh, so what if you treat it a little bit more? What if you treat it a little more intensely? Add another medicine, reduce the blood pressure a little more. Does that still help? Um, this wasn't uh, quite as focused on older adults as HiVet was, but it did include a, a lot of adults who were over 75. 
Um, and it had a similar result. Treating blood pressure even a little more also reduced uh, your chance of dying. So this is the group that received the more intensive treatment, um, and their risk of dying was lower throughout the study. And after four or five years, again, it was about 20% lower than the typical group. So medicine saved lives. Treating blood pressure saves lives. Um, but it's not just that it, it keeps us from dying, but it also keeps us healthier. And this is, this is how it keeps us from dying. It, it helps to prevent serious problems like heart, heart attacks and strokes. Uh, the most dramatic data from that HIVET trial, uh, again, the trial of people over 85, was in preventing heart failure. So heart failure is a serious complication of high blood pressure um, that can really affect your life, make it hard for you to walk, hard for you to get around, uh, make you feel terrible. Um, Patients who received the blood pressure medicines in, in HIVET were much, much less likely to develop heart failure over the four or five years of the study than the patients who didn't treat their blood pressure. So medicines save lives, medicine make us, medicines make us healthier, medicines help us to live a better life. But, and this is what we'll talk about for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, too much of anything can hurt you. And the real trick is knowing what is too much. So even water. We can't survive without water. If you're in the desert, a drop of water, a glass of water is, is going to save your life even more than a blood pressure medicine will. Uh, but too much of anything can hurt you. If you drop yourself into, a, into an ocean, you'll drown. Water is necessary for your life. It saves your life in the right circumstance, but too much of it can still harm you. Anything that, uh, that you, any, too much of anything can hurt you. The trick is knowing where to draw the line and how to watch out for when you're crossing over into too much. Um, so polypharmacy. What does polypharmacy mean? Uh, poly is too much. Pharmacy is, is a synonym for, for drugs, for medications. Polypharmacy means too many medications. Polypharmacy is a problem. Uh, polypharmacy means that, uh, that you're starting to move over from medicines are clearly helping to medicines are starting to do some harm too. The real trick is where do you, how do you know what's too much? Uh, First, we'll talk about what are some of the problems that polypharmacy can cause. Um, so having just said that medicines are wonderful, medicines save lives, medicines keep you healthy, medicines can hurt you too. So what are some of the problems that taking too many medicines can cause? And we'll walk through these uh, one by one. So first, all medicines have side effects. All of you guys probably know this. Many of you have experienced side effects from medicine. They can be small, they can be large, they can be bothersome, they can be life-threatening. Medicines have side effects. The more medicines you take, the more likely you are to have side effects. If you only take one medicine that has you know, a couple of possible side effects that maybe you'll feel, maybe you won't. If you take 10 medicines, they all have side effects, and the odds of you feeling some sort of side effect are much greater. So the more medicines, the more likely you are to have side effects. Medicines interact with each other. Some medicines can make other medicines work less well, or on the, on the other hand, they can make them work too well, and they can cause side effects by uh, essentially increasing the dose. So if you only take one medicine, there's nothing for it to interact with. If you take two medicines, now they can interact with each other. If you take 10 medicines, they can all interact with each other in dozens, hundreds of different ways. So the more medicines you take, the more likely you are to have interactions that can be harmful. The more medicines you take, the harder it is to take them all as you and your doctor intend. I have a hard enough time taking one medicine once a day. Um, twice a day, three times a day, I can't when I've tried. Uh, if you're taking 12 medicines that you have to take 19 times a day, uh, this gets harder and harder. And odds are that no matter your best intentions, best circumstances, best help, best everything, you're not gonna take them all as you and your doctor intend. Watching out for prescribing cascades. So we'll talk more about this in detail. This is the idea that uh, when you experience side effects, often you'll wind up treating those side effects with more medicines, more medicines that can, can themselves have more side effects. Uh, you want to avoid prescribing cascades, but this can become very easy if you're taking 6, 8, 12, 16 medicines. Uh, medicines are expensive. This is an important issue for us as a society at large. It's an important issue for us individually. Uh, you shouldn't have to choose between living in your own home, between uh, buying food and paying for your medicines. But the more medicines you take, the more likely that some of them are going to be ex very expensive. Uh, the more medicines you take, the more you'll spend on them. Um, you want to make sure that those medicines are actually helping you. And finally, and I, this is actually really important to me, this idea of the more medicines we take, um, 
the more things that we're treating, the more that your life becomes centered around your medical care, around your medicines. I'm sure some of you have the experience of feeling like uh, your day, your schedule throughout the day is basically driven by taking your medicines. And a lot of the things that you do out of your house, a lot of the things that you do even with your kids, with your, uh, with your parents, with your families, are centered around getting to the doctor, uh, getting your medicines from, from, from the pharmacy, calling the insurance company, calling the pharmacy, your life centers around your medical care, um, medicalizing life. Um, I'd rather that, that our lives centered around our lives and that our medical care helped to support that. Okay, so if too many medicines causes problems, why do so many of us take too many medicines? Uh, well, because it's really easy to take too many medicines. It's really easy to prescribe medicines. Um, we get diagnosed with diseases. Diseases have guidelines. Those guidelines include taking medicines to treat the disease. Therefore, we have a disease, our doctors look at the guidelines, we prescribe some medicines, we follow the guidelines, and all of a sudden we're on 17 medicines. It's really easy to do. If you're a good evidence-based doctor, this is even easier. Follow the guidelines. Um, and I'll say, when I, I'm going to talk about you and your doctor, but uh, there's a whole team of healthcare professionals that will be involved in, in prescribing medicines for you and monitoring them. Not just your doctors of, of all stripes, uh, but nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, pharmacists. Whenever I say doctor, translate it into saying your entire healthcare team of, of professionals who's helping with your medicines. But just for shorthand, I'll say doctor. So, Following guidelines makes it really easy to prescribe too many medicines. So this is an example that was in a, a prominent medical journal about 10 years ago um, of, a, of a common example. This is hypothetical, but uh, many of the, this probably represents many of you in the audience. A 79-year-old woman with five common diseases, diabetes, emphysema, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, and osteoarthritis. If those are the only five things that your doctor can find wrong with you at 79, you're probably doing pretty good. But those diseases all come with treatment guidelines. A variety of medicines, inhalers, diet interventions, modifications. Uh, and if you were to follow those guidelines to the T for just these five conditions, this is what your day looks like. You wake up at seven o'clock to take your first dose of an inhaler, uh, along with once a week your alendronate for your osteoporosis. Make sure you sit upright for 30 minutes after taking the alendronate. Remember to check your blood sugar. Uh, remember to check your feet for the diabetes. And now you're done for seven o'clock. An hour later, you take, uh, geez, how many pills is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You take nine pills at eight o'clock. Uh, make sure they're the right ones. Make sure it's the white one with the vertical score and not the blue one with the horizontal score. Uh, carefully plan out your diet. You know, you can't eat just anything if you have diabetes. You have to follow the DASH diet or make sure your cholesterol is low, you follow your potassium, your sodium, take care of your kidneys. Um, and that's breakfast. Lunch. Well, at least there's no pills at lunch. Just focus on the food for lunch. Uh, at one o'clock, you have, you have another inhaler. You have more pills. At seven o'clock with dinner, you have the evening doses of a bunch of these things. Uh, you have the fourth dose of your inhaler at 11 o'clock. There's another inhaler you can use whenever you want. This doesn't even talk about like exercise and activity guidelines. Uh, you know, th this is more scheduled than my day. Your entire life would revolve around just taking your medicines. It's a full-time job, exactly. And then you need someone else to, to help actually get the medicines. Get them from the pharmacy, negotiate with your insurance company, go see the doctor, uh, figure out, you know, get all the pills out of the boxes, lay them out. Uh, this is a full-time job. So polypharmacy is easy. Um, this, if you add this up, this is 12 different medicines for those five diseases, but divided up over 19 individual doses that happen at five times during the day. No one can do this. Uh, this, is, this is clearly past the point of, of helpful into polypharmacy. Too much of a good thing. Uh, but I'm going to guess that this sounds familiar to a lot of you. Um, so older adults who live in the community, you know, who are independent, who take care of themselves, 28% of older adults take five or more medicines. Uh, people who are in nursing homes, they tend to have more diagnoses, more problems, they take more medicines. They take a lot more medicines. People in nursing homes, about three quarters of them take nine or more medications. So polypharmacy is, is very, very common among older adults. Now the thing is, medicines save lives. So therefore, more medicines should be better, right? And you think the more medicines you take, the more likely that you'll be taking the right medicines. You know, nothing is going to slip through the cracks. If you're taking 12 medicines, you're probably not missing anything, right? You're taking all the ones that are going to help you. 
Um, well, that's actually not necessarily the case. It turns out that when you, when you look at lists of medicines that people take, the more medicines you take, you're not, uh, you're not, um, you're not missing anything by taking fewer medicines. But what is happening is the more medicines you take, the more likely that one or more of them is not helping you. So this is some, some data from veterans in San Francisco that Michael Steinman uh, at UCSF compiled a few years ago. So he looked at the number of medicines that veterans take, um, and you can see this goes all the way up to 20, which is not terribly unusual. Um, and then the number of, of those medicines that are potentially problems. So these are medicines that potentially could be unsafe, or at least should be thought about carefully. Uh, medicines that are, are ineffective, uh, that just don't work for what the person is taking them for, that are unnecessary, the person doesn't obviously have an indication to take that medicine, uh, or they just duplicate another medicine the person's already taking. So potentially problematic medicines. So you see, as you take more and more medicines, the number of underused medicines, medicines that that person should be on but they're not, doesn't really change. So you're not much more likely to have a to be missing a medicine if you're taking 15 than if you're taking five. What does change, though, is the odds that you're taking a medicine you shouldn't be rises dramatically. So if you're only taking five medicines, then probably most of them are okay. If you're taking 15 medicines, uh, then it's almost certain that that's one or more of them you shouldn't be on, uh, and on average, about three of them maybe you shouldn't be on. So adding more and more medicines doesn't necessarily fill in the gaps, but it just makes it more likely that you're taking something you probably shouldn't be. So this is the first of the key principles I want you to leave, leave here with. That as you add more and more medicines, medicines save lives, but as you add more and more medicines, each additional one has a diminishing benefit uh, and an increasing risk of harm. I like graphs, so I'm going to show you some graphs. And hopefully this will uh, make it a little bit easier to, uh, to understand. So, Thinking about blood pressure, for example, if you have really high blood pressure, that makes it unfortunately likely that you'll die from a stroke or from a heart attack. Think FDR. Uh, FDR died from a stroke that was brought on by really high blood pressure. World War II probably didn't help, uh, but he had very high blood pressure. If he could just have taken one blood pressure medicine, and these were just starting to become available when, when he was president, if he could have just taken one blood pressure medicine, he probably would have lived through World War II. The first medicine that you take for a serious disease is gonna have, if it's the right medicine, is gonna have a huge benefit. The second medicine doesn't have as much to add. You've already kind of plucked the low-hanging fruit. You've gotten a lot of the benefit. The second medicine is just going to add a bit more. The third medicine is going to, it may still add something, but it'll be even less. The fourth medicine even less, the fifth medicine even less, the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth medicine you take for a given condition, you're probably then starting to turn the corner and, and, they're, um, and they're not going to help at all. So each medicine you add is a little bit less helpful than the last. The first medicine is the most important. So each additional medicine may still help, but not as much. If you graph out the number of medicines you take for a condition um, and the, the, the size of the effect, the size of the benefit, how much less likely you are to have a heart attack, uh, how much less likely you are to have a stroke, uh, the curve starts to level off as you take more and more. Um, and this makes sense, right? There, you reach, theoretically, you reach some point where medicines have done all they can. It's just a question of how many medicines it takes to get there. On the flip side, though, each additional medicine you take adds even more and more and more to the risks of harm. So if you're only taking one medicine, uh, like we talked about a few minutes ago, there's nothing for it to interact with, so there's no risks of medication interactions if you only take one medicine. You could have side effects from even one medicine, but it's only the one medicine, so you know, maybe it causes a couple side effects, but just a couple side effects you might be exposed to. If you're taking 10 medicines, they all interact with each other. The, the 11th medicine, you don't just have to worry about its interaction with the 10th medicine, you have to worry about its interactions with all 10 of them. So each medicine you add increases the risk of harm, uh, potentially exponentially. So if you're already taking 12 medicines for a condition, you're, when you're thinking about adding a 13th, you shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm already taking 12, what's one more going to do? You should be thinking, I'm already taking 12. That means that the 13th, I have to worry about it making the side effects worse from all the other 12. I have to worry about it interacting with all the other 12. It's actually probably going to add as much harm as, say, the first eight or nine of them did. Each additional one, the potential harm is that much greater. So. 
as you take more and more medicines, the benefit starts to, to level off and the risk of harm starts to go through the roof. So where you want to be, together with your doctor, is in this nice sweet spot right in the middle, where you're taking enough medicines to get a lot of benefit uh, to save your life, uh, but where you're not taking so many medicines that the risk of the harm is starting to, to cross that over. You want to choose your medicines wisely. So related to this is the Goldilocks principle. So this is the second principle I want you to leave here with. Not too much, not too little, it should be just right. I'll show you what I mean. So first of all, medicines save lives. Older adults benefit the most, usually, uh, from medicines to treat serious diseases. And this is because as we get older, we're more likely to develop diseases and we're more likely to have the serious, um, um, the serious uh, outcomes of diseases. So for example, a 50-year-old and an 80-year-old who have the same blood pressure, the same high blood pressure, the 80-year-old is much more likely to actually have a heart attack or a stroke. So the benefit the 80-year-old will get from taking a medicine for the blood pressure in reducing that risk is much greater. So older adults are more likely to benefit from judicious use of medications, more than younger people. On the other hand, older adults are also more likely to be harmed by overtreatment. Um, and if at the extremes, overtreatment can be just as dangerous as the disease that you're treating. You want to be careful to stay in, stay in the sweet spot, stay in the just right Goldilocks zone. So for example, uh, I like graphs. So I'm going to show you an example of a U-shaped curve. And we'll, we'll talk about this for a few minutes. U-shaped curves are everywhere in the medical care of older adults. So what does this mean? So on the one hand, we have uh, the risk of the disease. So for example, if you have high blood pressure, uh, this is your risk of dying from high blood pressure from a stroke or heart attack. On the other hand, we have the intensity of the treatment. So the more medicines that you take to treat your high blood pressure. So if you don't treat your high blood pressure at all, not enough treatment. If you don't treat your disease at all, uh, blood pressure is too high, you're, you're likely to have a stroke or a heart attack from not treating the disease. If you add a couple of medicines, get your blood pressure down just right, you'll be in this sweet spot uh, where you're not exposed to too much risk for your medicines, but you've really lowered the risk of the disease a lot. You're treating the disease effectively just the right amount, and this is the sweet spot for your health. If you keep going, if you keep adding more and more medicines, treat this more and more, uh, then you wind up ex getting exposed to the risks of overtreatment, the risks of the medicines themselves. In the case of blood pressure, this is driving your blood pressure too low so that maybe you pass out when you stand up, maybe you fall, maybe you break a bone, maybe you have a stroke because you're not getting enough blood up to your, up to your brain. So there are risks to too much treatment and there are certainly risks to too little treatment. The trick is to be right in the middle. Now, one of the major tasks for, for medical scientists is figuring out for any given disease, what, what does this really mean? What is the sweet spot for diabetes, for, for high blood pressure, for things like that? Um, I'll show you one example of, of real data, uh, and this again is about blood pressure, uh, showing you a, a real life example of this U-shaped curve. So this is, a, this is a huge study of over half a million older veterans who have high blood pressure and who also have kidney disease. Uh, now this was not a randomized trial like the ones we talked about earlier. This is just, these veterans are being treated by their doctors, standard of care, most of them are on blood pressure medicines, uh, and just looking at their blood pressure on treatment versus their risk of dying. So you'd think that if, they're not, if their blood pressure is really high, then of course that's going to be bad. They'll have strokes, they'll have heart attacks, they'll die from their high blood pressure. Uh, and indeed, their risk of dying is pretty high if their blood pressure is really high. This is over 200. But, the, but this is also true at the low end. If they're treated too much, if they have side effects from their blood pressure medicines, if their blood pressure is too low, their risk of dying also goes up. The sweet spot is somewhere in the middle here. Not too, not too little treatment, not too much treatment, but somewhere in the middle. In this particular case, that middle is pretty broad. You can see this curve is pretty flat between a blood pressure of about 120 and a blood pressure of about 160 or so. That's a pretty broad range where their risk of dying is the lowest. Um, and the trick with conditions like this is to, to figure out from, from large clinical trials, trying to narrow down for any given person with a given set of diseases, for example, where it is the, what is the perfect sweet spot? Should this person be under 160? Should this per person be under 140? Do we need to make sure that they never go under 100? 
you know, what is exactly the sweet spot? But here's a nice example of a sweet spot in older veterans who have high blood pressure and kidney disease. These U-shaped curves are everywhere in, the, in medical care of older adults. Uh, high, high blood pressure is probably where they're best characterized. You see this with, for example, control of sugar and diabetes, too, where too little is clearly harmful, uh, but too much can be harmful, too. There's a sweet spot that maximizes the person's quality of life and their survival and their risk of dying. You want to find that sweet spot. Okay, third principle. Everybody gets side effects. I get side effects from medicines. Everyone gets side effects from medicines. But older adults will get them worse. Uh, and there are some good reasons for that. I'm going to tell you about those reasons to help you think about uh, when you think you might be having a side effect from one of your medicines. So several reasons why side effects are worse in older adults. Many of them have to do with the way that our bodies universally change as we get older. Um, so things change. And this is not just about diseases. You know, diseases are one box. But this is also about changes to our bodies that essentially everyone goes through. So for example, our kidneys gradually slow down as we get older. This happens to everybody. Um, even if you don't have kidney disease per se, everyone's kidneys gradually slow down. Uh, less often, your liver might slow down a little bit too. But this becomes important for, for medications because many of the drugs you take are cleared out from your body through your kidneys. So if your kidneys are slowing down, the drugs will hang around. It's like you're taking a higher dose as you get older. So even if the pill doesn't change for 30 years, the way it affects your body might as your body changes underneath it. Uh, same is true for our body composition changes as we get older. Um, so no matter how fit and active you are, you will gradually lose muscle mass as you get older. Even if you're skinny as a rail, some of that muscle will turn into fat tissue. Um, I'm noticing that myself too already. Um, so our bodies change. And that's also important for medications because medicines uh, like to stay in different parts of your body depending on what the medicine is. Some medicines hang out in your fat tissue. Some medicines hang out in your blood and the muscle. So if your composition of your body is shifting, this again affects how a particular dose of a medicine will affect you. Even if the pill doesn't change, your body is changing underneath it. Um, as we've already talked about, as you get older, your risk of, of getting uh, diseases like diabetes um, increases. And so you often will wind up taking more medicines. And so not only do older people tend to have more diseases that can affect how medicines affect them, uh, but we tend to take uh, more medicines and are more exposed to polypharmacy and interactions and things like that. Um, and finally, and uh, we'll talk a little more about this, uh, even if you, an older adult experiences the same side effect as a younger person, it's more likely to affect them in a real negative way. So, and again, related to the, the changes that happen to our bodies as we get older. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in particular. So let's say you take a medicine. One of the side effects is that you can become a little dizzy. So a young person takes that medicine and they feel a little dizzy. OK, this feels kind of weird. That's all right. An older person takes that medicine, they feel kind of dizzy, and they fall and they break something. So why does that happen in an older person, but not the younger person? Well, in part, it's because of uh, the changes that happen to our bodies as we age. Um, as we get older, our bodies have a harder and harder time uh, coping with different stresses. Um, so whatever stress you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about dehydration, if you're talking about an infection, uh, if you're talking about uh, exertion, uh, your body is less able to cope with these extremes. We, we, we call the ability of a body to maintain a, a normal state, even in the face of these stresses, homeostasis. Whatever happens to your body, your body pushes back. Your body tries to stay in a normal state. Um, if I go out into the desert and stop drinking water, my kidneys will, uh, will hang on to my salt, will hang on to my water. They'll adjust what they're doing to try to keep me hydrated, even though I'm in the desert. They're trying to maintain homeostasis. Our ability to do that gets constricted as we get older. The range of conditions to which we can adapt gradually narrows. That's called homeostenosis. So stenosis meaning narrowing. So this is a narrowing of the conditions in which our body can maintain its normal state. Um, so the range of things uh, that we're exposed to that are OK gradually narrows as we get older. Um, so you can think of this in terms of you know, physical stresses, like dehydration or like, or like a, the flu. You can also think of it in terms of um, like side, responding to side effects from medicines. So a young person can cope with feeling dizzy. Their body reacts in other ways to make sure that that doesn't make them fall over. An older person has less of an ability to do that because of the way their body is changing. Um, 
So for example, how does a simple side effect like dizziness um, interact with the changes from aging to cause an older person to fall? Um, and a few examples, as you get older, uh, your arteries become less stretchy, they become stiffer. And that means that if your blood pressure drops, it's very quickly transmitted to all the organs of your body. Uh, a younger person has more uh, flexible arteries, so if the blood pressure drops, they can kind of squeeze a little more and maintain that blood pressure. Um, as you get older, your heart has a harder time getting up to higher heart rates. So we know that the maximum heart rate gradually trends down as you get older. One of the ways that you might compensate for having a low blood pressure is making your heart beat faster. But if you're, if you're an older adult, your heart has a harder time doing that. Um, your kidneys, as you get older, are less able to concentrate urine. So if you have a low blood pressure, if you get dehydrated, your kidneys are less able to compensate for that. Um, your muscles are a little bit weaker. So if you get dizzy and start to stumble, uh, a younger person might be able to catch themselves. An older person might not. They might not have the strength and the balance to do it. Um, your veins tend to pool blood in them. So if an older person is sitting still for a while, your blood kind of collects in your feet. Maybe your feet swell a bit. Uh, when you stand up, it takes a few minutes for that blood to get back up to the rest of your body. Um, and that predisposes an older person to, uh, to feeling dizzy or lightheaded when they stand up. So all these things together might contribute to someone uh, a little bit of dizziness turning into a serious problem like a fall. And it's not one of these things. It's not even just the medicine. But it's all of these things together, their additive effect, that takes a simple little problem like a bit of dizziness and turns it into a serious issue. So a corollary from this, um, that side effects are often worse in older adults, is that new symptoms in older adults should be thought of as medication side effects until proven otherwise. Side effects are common. Side effects are so common, we often don't realize that we're having a side effect. And that, that can lead to something like this. This is a prescribing cascade. Um, so let's say that you, uh, uh, you take your dad to the doctor for routine high blood pressure visit. Uh, blood pressure is a little bit high. The doctor adds a new medicine, amlodipine. OK, great. That'll help prevent strokes. Keep dad going. The next visit, though, Dad goes back to the doctor. Now he's having some leg swelling. Uh, this is new. Hasn't happened before. Um, you know, leg swelling is not unusual in older people. Often it's from a, a kind of heart failure that becomes more common with age. Um, uh, there's no really great treatments to prevent it from happening, but you can use a water pill like furosemide just to get the extra fluid off. So, okay, you have, have some leg swelling. Let's prescribe some furosemide. The next visit, go back to the doctor. Uh, now dad has some urinary incontinence. He's never had this before. Uh, this is also not uncommon in older adults. We don't talk about it enough. It happens. Um, there are medicines for it. So the doctor thinks, OK, I can treat urinary incontinence. I'll prescribe you some oxybutynin. This is a good medicine for urinary incontinence. And the next visit, uh, dad's kind of confused now. He's starting to have trouble with his short-term memory. He's getting a little confused about where he is. Um, you know, he's been acting kind of weird. You know, we're, doc, we're worried. Is this Alzheimer's? Um, and you put all this together, and, and boy, dad's had a bad few months. Every time he goes to the doctor, something else is new. Uh, heart failure, incontinence, dementia, these are terrible new diagnoses. Dad, dad's not doing well. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should have stopped the amlodipine. So all of these, all these may just be side effects of, of the different medicines. So, so leg swelling is a common side effect of amlodipine. The first reaction with new leg swelling after amlodipine maybe should be stop the amlodipine, see if it goes away. Um, incontinence is a common side effect of water pills like furosemide. These make you have to pee. That's how they work. Um, and so they're likely to, to cause or, or exacerbate urinary incontinence. Um, oxybutynin is a great drug for urinary incontinence, but it's a, it's a class of drugs called anticholinergic medicines that do affect your brain. Uh, and they can make older adults um, confused um, and even seem like they have dementia uh, when they don't. It's actually a side effect of the medicine. So maybe this confusion was actually just the... Maybe all of this were, were just side effects effects of medicines. And dad's fine. We just have to know uh, to stop things to try to treat symptoms, sometimes, uh, rather than immediately prescribing new medicines to treat new symptoms. Um, and you know, and, and I'll, I'll joke a bit about this. This, this is not, this is not mean that, you know, this is a hypothetical example. Um, 
uh, doctors who, who do this sort of thing, it doesn't mean they're bad doctors. Maybe they're being very thoughtful about it. And maybe they really just want to help. Um, but often it's, it's hard for us to overcome our instincts to, I see a problem, I must treat it. I, I have a medicine that will work for that. Here is that medicine. Um, it's much harder to remember sometimes, here's a problem. Let's try stopping this and see if that was the, the cause. Okay, so those are some principles for how you can think about the medicines that you take, how to take them safely. But what can you do? So now we're gonna, I'm gonna give you some very specific um, suggestions for what to talk about with your doctor um, to, to parse through the medicines you're taking and see that you're getting the most benefit with the least risk. First, if you take nothing else away from this, these 45 minutes, remember this. Ask your doctor, talk with your doctor, why am I taking this? This is the most powerful question you can ask to help prevent yourself. Why am I taking this? Um, and believe it or not, we're gonna talk for a few minutes about this. Why do we take medications? Why do we do anything in medicine? Uh, well, to stamp out disease. You have a disease, we will treat it. Um, don't think about it this way. Diseases are means to, means to an end, and it's the ends that really concern us. Um, so diseases carry risks of bad stuff happening. High blood pressure, for example, we're not really worried about it for its own sake. We're worried because high blood pressure causes strokes and heart attacks and kills people. Um, so when we're treating high blood pressure, what we're really trying to do is reduce the risks associated with that disease. When you treat diabetes, why do you lower blood sugar and diabetes? Well, it's not to, not to make your doctor happy about the number on the glucometer. It's to prevent long-term complications like blindness and kidney failure. It's to prevent short-term complications um, like ketoacidosis. So when we're treating diseases, one thing we're really thinking about is trying to lower the risk, the long-term risks associated with those diseases. The other thing we're trying to do with medicines is make people feel better. And there's nothing wrong with this. Um, a lot of diseases are uncomfortable, cause problems, affect uh, the way that we do our lives, uh, and it's very reasonable to take medicines to treat those symptoms, to feel better. We should feel better. Modern medicine should help us make us feel better. So I'd argue that when you think about why are you taking your medicines, don't focus only on I have this disease uh, and therefore I must take this medicine for it. Focus and ask your doctor, what am I trying to prevent with this medicine? What's the, what's the bad thing that I, I don't want to happen that this medicine will help with? And how is this medicine making me feel better? So for example, high blood pressure causes strokes. We take high blood pressure medicines in part to prevent strokes. Um, Parkinson's disease causes a tremor that makes it hard to do your daily life. Some of the medicines for Parkinson's disease may not change the course of the disease, but they can help control the tremor, uh, help control that symptom to help you live a better life. That's another good reason to take a medicine. Uh, but don't take medicines just because I have X, therefore I must take Y. The other component of this, though, is what is most important to you. So there is no medicine that you have to take. There is no medicine that you absolutely should not take. Um, everything should be filtered through this prism of what's important in your life. Is this, how important is preventing this risk? How important is this symptom? Um, how do you weigh those? If you have uh, several things that you take medicines for, how do you weigh their importance against each other? What's most impactful for your life? Um, and if there are, for example, side effects for the medicines, how do you weigh the expected benefits against the risks of the side effects? That's a very personal decision that you make, which your doctor can help advise you on, but ultimately is up to you. What's important to you? Okay. And beware of zombie medications. I guarantee that there are zombie medications in this room. These are medications no one knows where they came from, no one knows why they were started, no one remembers what they're for, but they don't go away. No one's brave enough to stop them. So zombie medications are extremely common. They often start off being prescribed for a very good reason, often in the emergency room, often in the hospital, and then they just stick around forever. No one ever asks, why am I still taking this? Should I be? Uh, and you wind up taking them four years later for no particular reason. Uh, often, often these are medicines that it turns out when you stop and think about it, they're really not doing anything for you and just they're just exposing you to additional risks. So watch out for zombie medications. The way to slay a zombie medication is to ask, why am I taking this? Okay, so is there a good reason for me to be taking this? Um, is this the right medicine? So how do you know if it's the right medicine uh, to be taking for whatever the good reason is? 
So one tool I want to give you are the beers criteria. Uh, Beers criteria are, are maybe not quite as fun as they sound. It's actually named for Dr. Beers, who was an eminent geriatrician, um, who about 20 or so years ago was the first person to compile this list of medicines that older adults specifically um, should be careful with. Not that they're necessarily all bad medicines, not that they should be completely avoided, uh, but that they should be only taken in a very thoughtful way. So it's a list of medicines that's updated every few years. The most recent update was just last year. Um, you can find the full list either on the American Geriatric Society website uh, or on healthandaging.org, which is a website maintained by the American Geriatric Society. Um, and some examples of what's, what's on the beers list, so things that you should be very cautious with. Uh, for example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines. Uh, things like naproxen and ibuprofen. These are very common medicines, but they can have serious side effects in older adults that tend uh, not to happen as much in younger people. So you should be careful with them. Certain diabetes drugs you need to be very careful with. Muscle relaxants and certain anxiety drugs. Uh, we mentioned briefly anticholinergic drugs like these bladder medicines that can affect your brain and your thinking and your memory. And not that you should never take them. Them, but you just need to be careful. Make sure you're taking it for a good reason. Um, certainly antihistamines for the same reason because they can be anticholinergic. Um, so you can, you can go to the website, you can look over this, this list of medicines and classes of medicines, and if you find you're taking any of these, again, it doesn't mean you should, don't stop. It doesn't mean that you, you definitely should not be taking them, but it does probably mean you should talk with your doctor and your team uh, about why am I taking it and are we sure this is the right medicine for me to take. So if, if, all, if all this came down to was making sure that you're not taking a handful of bad medicines, that would be a pretty easy job. Um, but it turns out that even that list of bad medicines actually doesn't cause most of the problems that people have from their medicines. So this is from a study a few years ago looking at what sort of medicines land people in the emergency room or in the hospital for side effects. Um, so these, these, are, these are dangerous medicines, medicines that have serious side effects that happen pretty commonly. So those, all those medicines in the Beers criteria are way over here. They're a pretty small bar. So they can cause problems, but in the greater scheme of things, they don't cause most problems. Um, take a look at the list. You know, if you can avoid an avoidable problem, that would be great. Um, but even if we eliminated all the problems caused by medicines on this, on this Beers list, um, we'd only make a dent in hospitalizations caused by medicine side effects. So what are the, what are the big game here? What are the big... The big um, the big medicines that cause most of the problems. Well, at the front of this list here, far bigger than any other bar, is warfarin, a blood thinner, and insulin for diabetes. These are not bad medicines. These medicines save lives. These are very important medicines. Use warfarin as a blood thinner that's used to prevent strokes primarily or heart attacks. Um, insulins, of course, are used for diabetes um, and can be life-saving, can prevent the long-term complications of diabetes. So these aren't causing problems because they're bad medicines, but they're causing problems because they are powerful medicines. They have powerful effects, and they have side effects that are an unavoidable uh, result of the way that they work. So warfarin, for example, thins blood. That's how it works. It prevents blood clots. If you prevent blood clots, you can also cause bleeding. There's no way around that. If, you, if it works too well, it'll cause bleeding. Same thing with insulin. Insulin lowers blood sugar. That's what it's supposed to do. That's how it works. But if it lowers blood sugar too much, that can be life-threatening. So some of the medicines you have to be most careful with are not bad medicines, but they're just powerful medicines. And the dangerous side effect is a direct result of how it works. You can't avoid it, but what you can do is watch it very closely. Um, well, I'll give you some tips on, on how to, if you're taking these powerful medicines, um, how to make sure that, the, uh, that you don't go too far, that the side effects don't become harmful to you. So powerful medicines like blood thinners, like drugs for diabetes, they save lives. But they carry powerful risks. You should know how the things that you do in your day-to-day -day life affect how the medicine works. So for example, warfarin, the blood thinner, um, what you eat can affect how well warfarin works. If you're taking warfarin, you have to be very careful to maintain a steady diet that doesn't change too much. Uh, because if you suddenly eat a bunch of spinach, for example, you can change the way that warfarin works dramatically. Um, so ask your doctors about what are, what are the things that you do that affect how these medicines work. Uh, things you eat, when you take it, um, how the medicine is monitored, things like that. 
know how to identify these serious side effects early. So what are the early signs of, of a little bit of bleeding from warfarin, for example? What are the early signs of your blood sugar being too low? Learn how to identify that to catch it early so that you can nip these side effects in the bud. And, and maybe most importantly, tell your doctor everything about these medicines. <clears throat> you know, these, these powerful medicines, the ones that carry powerful risks, you and your doctor should know everything about those medicines. Um, you know, if you, if you have trouble getting it, if you miss a dose, if you take too many, um, everything, that, everything to do about those medicines, you should be telling your doctor. Um, and if there's any doubt, if you have any questions, always ask for help. You know, these are, again, these are powerful agents, powerful for good, but also potentially powerful for bad. Okay, so right medicines. So is this medicine the right medicine for me? Um, so I think about this as overlapping circles. So when I think about whether to prescribe a new medicine for, for uh, someone in my office, I'm thinking about, um, this, is, this is precision medicine. This is trying to tailor your, your medical care to the person sitting in front of you. Starting from the guidelines, but then, uh, uh, but then individualized for that individual. So think about that person's medical history. What are the medical problems does that person have? How do those interact with the medicine I'm thinking about? What are the other medicines that they take? How do those interact with the medicine I'm thinking about? Uh, and then, again, what are the person's priorities? Um, what's most important to the person? Is this the, is this the, am I trying to treat the problem that's the most important thing to the person's life? The most important thing that'll help keep them healthier longer? Or is this, you know, the 10th or 12th most important thing? How do they weigh the side effects? How do they weigh the expected benefits? So, for every new medicine, and at least once a year for all of your medicines, ask your doctor, talk with your team, why am I taking this? Do I still need it? And is this still the best choice for me? Um, and then just briefly, the last point, make sure that all of your doctors know everything you take. This is up to you. Ultimately, you are the only person who really knows what goes into your body. Even if you're in a fantastic integrated healthcare system like the VA or the Kaiser, that list the doctor has in front of them still may not completely accurately reflect what you're actually taking. And the only way that, a, that your team can safely prescribe medicines for you is to know exactly what you're taking. So this is, this is in a lot of ways, up to you. Um, bring your medicines or keep an updated list that you bring to every appointment. Tell all of your doctors about any recent changes in your medicines. And ideally, in a perfect world, there'll be one doctor, one healthcare professional who you pick as your point person. This is the person who will do all of your prescribing. If you go to a specialist and they, they recommend a medicine for some condition, you'll bring that back to your, your point person and say, this doctor thinks I should take this. What do you think? And walk through those three principles. How does this, how does this relate to my other medical problems? How does this relate to the other medicines I take? And how, how does this fall in um, in my perception of what's most important to me. Um, ideally, hopefully you'll have a relationship with one healthcare provider who can help you think through all those decisions and do everything from one point. Okay. So to close up here, principles I'd like you to leave here with for how to think about your medications. Medicines save lives. As you take, but as you take more and more medicines, each one has a little bit less of a benefit and exposes you to a little bit more potential for harm. Both undertreatment and overtreatment can cause problems. Think of these U-shaped curves. Side effects are often worse in older adults uh, because of the way our bodies change as we get older. Um, and any new symptom is a medication side effect until proven otherwise. Don't fall victim to prescribing cascades. And what you can do. For every new medication, at least once a year for everything you take, talk with your doctor and your team. Why am I taking this? Am I taking this to prevent something bad or to, to feel better? Or do we not know? And is this a zombie that we should stop? Do I still need to take this? Is this important enough for me to take? If it's my 13th medicine, is it really important enough? Is this the right medicine? Is it on the Beers criteria? Have I changed in the 20 years I've been taking this medicine? And make sure that all of your doctors know everything you take and as best you can, make sure that your doctors know of any problems you have uh, with your medicines. And remember, less is often more. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. I'd be happy to take some questions for a few minutes.
Hello. Um, when you talked about taking multiple medications um, and that being problematic, were you talking about for one disease or for different diseases? For both. Oh. Um, so when, um, when we study the risks of taking multiple medications, uh, usually that's done in total. So the total number of medications a person is on for whatever conditions that they're taking them for. Um, when I showed, for example, a graph of each new medicine adds a little bit less, uh, that's true both for an individual condition and it's also true in general. So the, you know, the fourth, the fifth blood pressure medicine uh, that you take is probably having less of a benefit than the first and the second. But also, of all the medicines you take, the 18th and 19th, I guarantee, are having less of an effect than the first or the second, for whatever reason. But great question. Is there a computer program where the doctor could list all the medicines you're on and then uh, discern from that if there's a bad mix there that you shouldn't be taking, say, a particular two? Can that be looked out online? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the question is, are, are there programs that you can plug in your list of medicines and see if there are interactions between them? Um, some of the uh, some of the medical data websites, like uh, like UpToDate, for example, and these are or Micromedics. These usually require subscriptions, but you may be able to access it through your university library. Um, they often have tools like that, where you can simply paste in a list of medicines, and it'll go through its database and show you all of the potential interactions. Um, if it's a long list of medicines, it's a long list of interactions usually. Um, your doctor should have access to something like that too, and actually most electronic health systems in some way try to automate that so that whenever you add in a new prescription, it'll automatically tell you these are a list of potential interactions. Um, I think it's still helpful, even though those tools are often automated these days, it's still helpful to just sit down with the list and look at it. Um, because one thing the computers can't tell you is how important is this potential interaction um, and how important is it to the person sitting in front of you. And that's something you can only really get by looking at that list of interactions all at once together uh, with you and your doctor. I would like to know if how many medicines you can take at one time for different things. Ah. <laughs> so trying to pin me down here, exactly how many is too many? And, and there is no answer to that. Um, it depends on the person and it depends on what the medicines are for. Um, at some point, too many is too many. And you know, probably one, two, or three are almost certainly not too many. What about uh, five probably or six? <laughs> five or six is probably fine, uh, oh, depending yeah. if depending how important are the reasons that you're taking them. Well, some are blood pressure and heart. Yeah. And stomach. <laughs> so I'll, in general, I'll say the data on when too many really causes harm. Um, five or six is starting to get there where there's some, some evidence that the risk is increasing. By the time you get to 10, I'd say you're definitely in that area where the risk is increasing. It's not unusual for me to see people on 15 or 20 medicines. That's clearly in the too many range. Um, you know, five to six, I would say, is you're just getting there. And it's important to at least think about um, how important are these? If they're, if they're all really important for good reasons, they're not causing your side effects. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>